Well, why don't we remain standing? We're going to get straight into the Word in a moment. We have uh, uh, one of our young men, uh, oh, slightly older than me, but I call him a young man. And uh, <laughs> uh, Scott Tolley, who, who's been up here, has led the service for us uh, over the last few weeks and months. And, uh, and I've asked him to come and preach a Word that I know that he lives himself and has lived for many, many years. And so there's a lot of power behind uh, what he's about to uh, preach today. And so we'll welcome him in a minute. But as we always do, before we start to uh, minister the Word of God, we, we stand together in honour of the Word and uh, we read the Scripture from where he'll be preaching from or a part of. So this comes from Matthew, 7, uh, Matthew 16, verse 24 to 26. And it says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We, we read this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome Scott as he comes to minister the Word. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, church. How are you? While you're taking your seats, why don't you turn around and say good day to someone this morning. Thank you guys. Awesome job this morning. Very cool. Thank you, kids. Why don't you give the kids a hand this morning? It's really cool to have you in the service with us this morning. How are you, church? You doing well? What a great song. How precious is the flow. Oh, man. Anybody love that song? I don't know why I do. Fantastic. I want you to turn to the person next to you this morning and say, so you want to be a disciple? Say so you want to be the disciple. Turn to the person on the other side. You say you want to be the disciple, do you? <laughs> I want to talk about discipleship this morning. And while we're doing that, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Pastor George just read out uh, a passage of Scripture which he has actually just visited in the last few weeks and we'll visit that in a minute. But in Matthew chapter 10... Jesus says those same words. And so what I want to do is before that, I want to give you a little bit of context of um, when Jesus first says to His disciples these words. I want to give you a bit of a context. He's uh, basically called the 12 to Himself and He's about to send them out on a little missions trip. Okay, up until that time, Jesus has basically um, walked with the disciples. He's already called them to Himself. So they've been walking with Him. They've been watching Him. They've been seeing what He's done. They've seen Him heal people. They've seen Him love people. They've seen Him lay hands on the sick and seeing them recover. They've watched Him heal a dead girl. They've watched Him do all these things. And, and um, as I look even back through uh, chapter 9, I'll go through that just to give you a bit of context. He heals a dead girl. He also heals a woman who had the issue with blood. We know this story. He heals a blind man and a mute man, heals a demon possessed. All the while, the disciples are watching him. They're watching him. They're observing him. And so Jesus gets to a point where he actually calls the 12 to him in, in Matthew chapter 10. And he says, boys, I'm going to send you out on a bit of a missions trip. And he says these words. He basically says, okay, on this particular missions trip, I don't want you to go to the Samaritans. I don't want you to go to the Gentiles. I want you to go to the lost sheep of Israel. This is your mission. Go preach about the kingdom, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy. Freely you have received, freely give. So I want you to understand up until this point, they've watched him do it. Now he's called the disciples to himself and he's asking them to do it. Are you with me this morning, church? And so he goes on and then he gives them almost the, uh, the bottom line. You know, the fine line. It's almost like, you know, those, those ads on TV where, you know, it's, a, it's one of those politician ads and they'll, they'll say something and, they make this, and then they'll say, and uh, Parliament camera. And you're kind of going, what the heck did he just say? You know, so it's kind, kind of almost um, the, fine, the fine print down the bottom. You know what I'm talking about this morning? 
So he says these words and, you know, don't go to those towns and this is what you're supposed to do. He gives them specific instructions. Don't take a bag or whatever, do this. And he says, if they, if they reject your message, wipe the dust off your feet as a testimony to them because it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town that rejected that message that you just preached. Pretty full on words. Then he goes on and he says, oh, by the way, you may get taken up into the synagogues. You may get beaten. How many of you know, if you're a disciple, you're sort of thinking, great, missions trip. And then he starts giving you the fine line. You're going, okay, not quite sure if I want to do that. So he goes on, be on your guard against men. They'll hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues on account of me. A little bit further down, he says, a student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Really, really important. A student isn't above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Don't be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed. And he goes on, whoever acknowledges before me before men, I'll also acknowledge them before my father. Then listen to these words that he speaks to them. Jesus doesn't mince words, church. You, know, you understand this, yeah? We've read this before. I do not suppose or do not suppose that I've, not come, I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against a daughter-in-law, a mother against a mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. How many of you have ever experienced that before? You don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> then he says these words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. Wow. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Pretty full on words, church. And then he sends them out. And we know the story. They come back and it's like, wow, they're all rejoicing. We've, we saw the, you know, the sick healed and all these things. They come back. Even demons submit to us in, in your name. And he's going, don't worry about that. Just worry about the fact that your name's written in heaven. Amen? We know this. But I can imagine the, those words as they came across to Jesus. If anyone wants to come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. To them, that wasn't just a, a blanket statement to everybody. That was kind of a pretty vivid graphic picture in their minds. By that stage, they already knew that the Romans had taken over. And whenever there was a criminal or, or a lawbreaker and they wanted to make a public spectacle of them, you know and I know that they would take them up to the cross, uh, to, the, to the hill of Golgotha. They'd strip them naked, they'd beat them, they'd nail them to a cross for everyone to see dead crucified. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you've got to, do, you've got to have this heart within you every day to take up your cross. You've got to be prepared to lay it all down. You see, Jesus is demanding total commitment from his disciples. Turn to the person next to you and say, so you want to be a disciple? <laughs> Not so enthusiastic now, are we? <laughs> you know, this is actually the first mention of the cross uh, to the disciples. This is the first time he actually ever mentioned it and evoked a picture of a violent, degrading death. Like I said before, he was demanding total commitment from them, even if it meant physical death. And making this call to full surrender was part of their message that they were to proclaim to others. We see in the Scriptures that this same life or death devotion to Christ was also repeated in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, which Pastor George just read out. Now, most of us will have known that passage of Scripture because we've been going over it through the last uh, few weeks. It also says it and repeat it again in Luke 9, chapter 23 and 24. Let's just flick over a few pages to Luke 16, if you're following with your Scripture. Up until this stage, Jesus has got his disciples, they're following him. And like we've, we've visited over the last few weeks, what's happened is, is he's basically said, okay, who do the people say that I am? Some say this, some say that, some say the other thing. Some say, you could, you're, the, you're the Christ. You're, you're, oh, sorry, you're, you're this, that and the other. 
So then he turns to Peter and basically says, okay, Peter, disciples, who do you say that I am? We know Peter piped up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He makes this confession. Now the Bible tells us that he rejoiced at that point and basically turns around and says, Father, I thank you that it was your good pleasure and will to reveal this truth that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, to little children. It was a work of the Father to reveal that to him. Are you with me, church? And so we read in verse 16 and verse 24, it's just after what Pastor George has been preaching because what's happened is from that time on, the Bible says, he began to explain to him that he himself is about to go to the cross and die for them. So much so that Peter's like, this is my mate. I want you to capture this this morning. This is my mate. He pulls Jesus aside and says, far be it from you to do this. And as we know, Jesus turns his back and says, get behind me, Satan. You have not the things of God in mind. You've got the things of man in mind. We've learned that over the last few days. And it's from that that he actually turns around and says, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Pretty full on words this morning, church. Repeat it again in, verse, in Luke chapter 9, if you're taking notes. But just as you may think that uh, maybe that was the call to the disciples. I mean, he's not telling you and I to lay down our lives, is he? Why don't you flick over a few pages and we'll go to Mark. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. It says this. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would take his would take if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So we know full well that he's not just talking to the twelve. This wasn't a select few. This was to anyone that was to follow him. That is actually the same passage of Scripture, but Mark records that there was actually a crowd there as well. So it wasn't just to the 12, it was actually to everyone. This is Jesus preaching. This is Jesus' evangelism. How do you suppose he's doing at the moment with his evangelistic endeavours? Let's turn to Luke 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, have a Luke in Luke. Sorry, that's a dad joke. I can't help it. (laughs) you've got to give me that. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me must not be my, cannot be my disciple. Could hear a bin drop in this place this morning. <laughs> you know, the truth is, church, is that sometimes we forget that we want to be a disciple, but it will cost us everything. It will cost us everything. If any of you have been around for a long time and you know the passage of Scripture, you know we've just seen plenty of times replete in the Scripture that this is what Jesus demands. You know, I think it's no good to call him Lord if he's not actually Lord of our lives. Amen? Was Jesus a good evangelist? Well, let's go and have a look. Let's look at Jesus' evangelistic endeavours because, I mean, you know, we want to be evangelists today. We want to see people want to Jesus. Is that true? When Jesus saw the crowds around him, he gave orders. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 18. Pardon me. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Thank you, I see that hand. Why don't you come down the front and just pray this prayer? Because if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. All you have to do is just pray this prayer. Why don't you close your eyes and bow your heads? Is that what Jesus said? No, he didn't. Verse 20 says, Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have, has nests, 
but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head and I uh, can imagine the guy just kind of walking off. You say, you don't want to follow me anymore. Another disciple came to him and said, first, Lord, let me go and bury my father. Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, said, no worries, I've got time. Is that what he said, church? No, he didn't. Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. You know, I honestly think that if Jesus actually was around today and he went to Bible college, he would fail evangelism 101. I mean, Jesus, really. You're pushing these people away. Don't you realise they are seekers? They've come to you. They want to follow you. And you lay down the law like that? Great evangelist. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about Mark, in Mark, sorry, chapter 10 and verse 17, the rich young ruler. Great little passage of scripture. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, it was all about salvation. It's got nothing to do with money. This whole passage was about salvation. What happens? He comes to Jesus. He's actually a synagogue ruler. So get this. He's a synagogue ruler, okay, which means he would have, and he's young. So he's actually very well respected, very rich young man, very well respected in the community. And the Bible actually says in Mark that he ran up to Jesus, bows his knees, falls to his knees and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now Jesus picks up the fact that he's just called him good teacher. Now, for those of you who don't know, you don't call a rabbi a good teacher. Why? Because no one's good but God. Hello. That was only reserved for God. You don't call anyone good. That was always reserved for God. That was in the mindset of those, uh, the Pharisees, the synagogue rulers. They all, all knew that. And so you don't run up to Jesus and say, good teacher, unless you kind of want to, you know, butter him up a little bit. So Jesus then turns around and says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. I'll tell you what to do. Follow the commandments. So he gives him law. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And he goes, oh, all of those I've done since my young days. I've done them all, Jesus. But then Jesus nails him and says, okay, you want to be perfect? Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor, right? And then you'll have treasure in heaven. So all of that was about was him having treasure in heaven. But then he actually says, and then come and follow me. And what happened to the rich young ruler? The Bible says that he went away sad. Why? Because he's not willing to be a disciple. Because it's going to cost you everything. Jesus nails him right there and then. But obviously he's uh, not doing well in the evangelistic 101 type of thing because he's just pushed this guy away but you see Jesus when he calls us even though he gives us life even though he has died on the cross for us which is a free gift of salvation the good news yes church the message that we preach if you want to follow Jesus it also will cost you everything it will cost you everything See, Jesus preached a hard message. Just to let you know, there was no one in the Bible that preached about hell more than Jesus. No one spoke about hell more than our Messiah, our Lord. Sometimes I think we're far too apologetic in these days. You're with me, church? No, I'm not talking about condemning anyone to hell. I'm talking about explaining to them the consequence of sin. That's all it is. The gospel itself has always been and always will be confrontational in nature. Have a look right throughout history. The the history tells us that we are here today based on the blood of the martyrs, those who have gone before us, who decided that their life wasn't worth living and opened their mouths so that someone else might know the good news. 
Turn to the person next to you and say, so you want to be a disciple? You weren't so enthusiastic as you were a few minutes ago. You see, friends, the gospel, like I said, is confrontational in nature. It puts you in the position where you decide heaven or hell, life or death. How many of you know that? It calls out sin and the consequence thereof, but it also reveals the solution that is found in Jesus Christ. It demands nothing less than radical obedience, even obedience unto death. So you want to be a disciple. But the promise it brings, ah, uh, yeah. But the promise it brings is a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I wouldn't have it any other way. Friends, let me ask you this morning, is it worth your life? Is He worth your life? Yeah. You're right. It is worth it. You see, this is a lordship issue. Jesus is either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. Of your life, that is. Many times we visit this whole word, this concept of a disciple, and we talk about, you know, a disciple is a, a teacher and a student, a, uh, that kind of relationship. And yes, it is. But with Christianity, I can tell you, friends, it's so much more. It's so much deeper. God calls you into a relationship with Himself that you can get to know God personally. That Jesus Christ loved you and I enough to go to the cross, die a horrible death and be the example to us. All the while the disciples watched. I want you to catch this this morning. All the while the disciples watched what Master Jesus did, what Rabbi Jesus did, what Rabbi Jesus said. Amazing. Jesus, my friends, today is the ultimate example of what it is to be a disciple. Look no further than Jesus. How do I know that? Well, read the Scripture. Let the Scripture this morning be the preacher. Plenty of times he basically said it's going to cost this, but it will mean eternal life. And as they followed him, they said, they watched the master and they did all that he said. They ate with him. They traveled with him. They camped out with him. I like that one. I like camping. They mimicked him. They followed the example of Master Jesus. They watched how he healed. They watched how he loved people. You know, I think sometimes today, we kind of get a little bit too err on the side of caution. We become politically correct. I love the fact that we, you know, do so many things within church life and it, it is about showing the love of God. But make no mistake, friends, the, the gospel itself is confrontational in nature. It always has and it always will be. He confronted the religious like I think no one I've ever seen. I mean, you guys are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Your father is Satan. Oh, I see that hand. <laughs> Somehow I don't think that uh, he'd be welcome in a few churches these days. Jesus, whether we like it or not, drew a line in the sand. And he calls us to come. You see, what we get wrong sometimes is we ask Jesus to come into our life and we have this concept of your life will be better because Jesus comes into your life and he'll give you eternal life, which is absolutely all true. But we forget the bottom line, you know, people are all on camera. 
spoken by, yeah, that's what it is, spoken by blah, 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 Canberra. We forget the bottom line. Oh, yeah, by the way, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your whole life. Sorry that I didn't mention that. Sometimes in church life, and I know not here, but sometimes in church life, and I've been there before, you've been there before, we just want to get them in the door. We just want them to get to know Jesus, and then we'll tell them later that sort of stuff. Jesus did it at the start. Yes, he loved people. He healed sick. He raised the dead. He did the works of the love of God. Amen. He did those works, but at the same time, he says, you want to follow me? This is what it's going to take. So you want to be a disciple? (laughs) Oh, Jesus. He confronted the religious. He drew a line in the sand. And I love what... The Apostle John says, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture because like I started before, started saying before is that what we've got to get in our heads is that Jesus is is the example of what a disciple should be. Why? Because the disciples, his 12, watched him. And then it wasn't long after that, that when he died, when he rose again and he ascended, he said, wait for the promise of the Father. Who was that? The Holy Spirit. Wait for the promise of the Father. And then after that, it would seem as though these apostles turned the whole world upside down. In fact, the Scripture records that. That people were saying, these guys are winning the whole world. So much so, and we we visited it way earlier when Pastor George was preaching about it, that they were first called Christians in Antioch. They were first called Christians in Antioch, which means... Little Christs. Capture that for a moment. They so acted like Jesus in word, in deed, that they said, these guys just look like him. First John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. This is what John says. I love this. That which is from the beginning, he's talking about Christ. And his deity. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it, testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. You want to know what a disciple is? Look at the disciples. Look at what they did. Why is this important? Because you and I want to be disciples today, amen? (laughs) George does. Well done, George. Good job, yeah. You know, it's one thing to define what a disciple is. It's another thing to be one. It really is where the rubber hits the road, church. And you know, at least I hope you know, that in no way do I mean this in condemning way. I'm just taking the scripture and saying, okay, Lord, what's a disciple? I want to be a disciple. What is a disciple? Well, a disciple is someone who follows the master so closely, they watch him, they, they see exactly what he does and they do likewise. Did you know that you and I are called into a living relationship with Jesus? Because by the way, he rose from the grave. Hello, church. <laughs> by the way, he rose from the grave. You and I are called to a one-on-one relationship with the king of the universe. This same king of the universe, we just read exactly who he is, exactly how he acts, exactly how he reacts. That's why we pray for the sick. We just did it before. That's why we lay hands on the sick and believing by faith that they will be healed. That's why I believe we should be uncompromising and unceasing when we preach the word of God. In our domains, most of you will know that we've 
been talking about going into our domains and I'm really looking forward to the next month. We've got apologetics month. We're going to get into the word and we're going to get into some, the nitty gritty. Turn to the person next to you and say, we're getting into the nitty gritty. Very cool. It's, I'm really looking forward to that. But friends, let me just qualify this. All of that means nothing if we don't open our mouth and preach the gospel. We can give an answer and a defence for our faith, which is so important. But all of that is about drawing people to the master, getting them to a point where they understand what they believe is actually reasonable. It's actually truthful. It's actually scientific, dare I say it, in this day and age. I was 20 years of age. 20 years. I had flowing locks. You don't believe me, do you? I was looking for a photo because I knew no one believed me. Yes. There was a, I knew a man once. <laughs> oh dear. Flowing locks. Oh Jesus. I think I might get them when I get to heaven. Maybe they need them up there, I'm not sure. But I was 20 years of age. My parents had divorced when I was 13. Um, that devastated me. And I remember just being a rat bag, total rat bag when I was growing up. Um, I was heavily into skating and then through the skating scene, it was all a street scene and whatever, I met up with some guys and I got caught in drugs. And for three years I was absolutely so heavily into drugs that um, it was all that I was about and um, I had lost my apprenticeship I was on the dole and uh, crazy time got in trouble with the police a number of times and uh, at the age of 20 I had only just turned 20 on February the 19th of 1992 and uh, I went, uh, a friend of mine had a motorbike accident. His name was Mark. His name's Mark Benes, so we called him B. This is my mate B. I'm going to talk to you about B. And uh, so B had an accident, a motorbike accident. What happened was is that he had a head-on collision with another motorbike. They were just on dirt bikes. He wasn't wearing a helmet. And, the mate, and my mate Spaz, yes, that's right, that's what we called him. Spaz wasn't wearing a helmet. He had dreadlocks, awesome hair. Um, Spaz had a helmet on. And uh, he had a head-on collision, come around a blind corner. They literally went bang. And uh, Spaz went forward. The helmet went straight into Mark's face. Broke his jaw from here, here, coming off his face. He ended down, down the bottom in the Mooney Ponds Creek. Uh, his leg was broken, I don't know how many times. Crazy. Almost died. He was in hospital for about six months. And um, after he came out, I remember because it wasn't long after my birthday, I had money to score drugs. And I was saying to my mates, let's go. This, I think it was Saturday. I can't re quite remember the, the actual day, but it was one of those days. And I said to, to Maddie, who was another mate of mine, and Zach, who was with me, and Paul, I've got some money. Let's go, boys. So what happened was is Maddie had learnt that Mark had gotten out of hospital. And he said, no, 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 I think we should, should go and visit Mark first. I'm like, are you for real? We're going to do this now? After I've got some money? I mean, I'm just trying to give you context that this was my mindset. So after much arguing, literally much arguing, I, I said to him, okay, no worries. Let's go to Mark's house. We'll go and see them. And um, after that, um, we'll go and score. All right, done, deal. Let's do that. So we get to Mark's and for some unknown reason, although I now know it's the sovereignty of God. I ended up on the, uh, dinner, t uh, the dinner table, which was in the kitchen at that time, and uh, Mark's mum, Mrs B, starts giving me the gospel. And Mark, uh, sorry, and, um, and Maddie and Zach. And we're sitting there, right? So here's, I want you to get this, ladies. Here's a mum. Yeah, yeah, sister. Here's a mum that decided to open her mouth. And she said, Scott, you've got to understand that before God, you're a sinner. She let me have it. I mean, let me have it, friends. 
So much of that foundation is with me today. She let me have it, man. I tell you, Scott, you got to understand, she took me through Romans. No mucking around. She took me through Romans. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. You've got to understand, Scott, that before God, you're a sinner. I'm going, Matt's going, Zach's going like this, you know. A mum. She tells us that the consequence of that sin is going to take you to hell. By now, I'm, I'm almost like sunk in the chair under the table, my goodness, as the conviction of God come upon my life. You didn't need to convince me that I was a sinner. I've heard a prominent pastor say, we don't need to tell people that they're sinners because they already know. No, they don't. And they don't understand the consequence of it. They don't. So here I am, brought up a Catholic. Yeah, I believed in Jesus. I'm sunken under the table almost in my heart as this mum pounds me with the gospel. She said, but God loves you. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I can tell you right now that I was almost in tears but I had a reputation to uphold. I had a rep to uphold. So I remember going, yeah, 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 yeah. I honestly believe, church, that at that moment I was saved. It was like the light switched on and I wanted to do whatever it takes. She also said to me, said to me a number of things, but one of the things she said to me is that you can know God personally, that God loves you and he wants to know you personally. God for me was always out there that hopefully one day the good will outweigh the bad and you know the story. That's not the truth. It was only Christ. It's ever only been Christ. It will only ever be Christ. Only ever be Christ. So here I am, Maddie's there, Zach's there. We're kind of convicted under the Holy Ghost. And listen to me, this is what she said. She goes, God knows your heart. She's looking at us like this. God knows your heart. Don't say you're going to come to Jesus and be a liar. What a woman. Don't say you're going to come to Jesus and be a liar. When you give your life to Jesus, it's serious. When you want to follow him, it's going to cost you everything. That's what she said. That's what she said to me. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Friends, at that point, I had lost everything anyway. What did I have? I'd given everything to a whole life that was sucking me dry. I wanted Jesus. I wanted this newfound life. I wanted to know him. All because one mummy decided to open a mouth. In the meantime, I didn't know this very same week, okay? Only a few suburbs away, there were two cousins that were together. These two cousins, one of them was a Christian, one was not, okay? One of them decides I've got to win my, my, my cuz to the Lord. So he starts telling him about Jesus, preaching the gospel to him. And this young man, how old were you, George? 18, you were 18. George was 18, so I'm a bit older than you. <laughs> because someone opened their mouth, George got saved. Little did I know that that same person that won Christ to the Lord, sorry, <laughs> Christ to the Lord, that won George to Jesus or, you know, introduced him to Jesus, that same guy was part of the youth group of Mr. Mr. and Mrs. B's church. So the youth pastor rings up Daniel, who's now in Sydney. He's flown to Sydney because he knew George had to go back to his family. And you and I both, all of us know what that meant for George and thought, I'm going to plug him into a local church. So he's gone and flown to Sydney, made sure that he's gone and plugged him into a local church because he cared enough. Hello, church. He cared enough. So then what happened was, 
Gary Rucci, who was the, the, the youth pastor back in those days, rings Daniel and says, Daniel, these druggies have given their life to Christ. They're at Mr. and Mrs. B's house every day. Will you come and start a small group, do something, teach them? Daniel goes, yeah, no worries. No worries. I wonder if Mr. and Mrs. B knew. I wonder if Daniel knew that these two people would end up being here today because of one mum that opened her mouth and opened her house because of one cuz who decides, you know what, I just want to tell my cousin about Jesus. By the way, Daniel's here this morning. Why don't you stand, Dan? Why don't you stand up? Come on, mate. I honour you, mate. <laughs> what a spin out. Isn't God good? No, I honour you, mate. You and Fiona. So, Jacob, why don't you stand up for a second? This is Jacob, his son, my nephew. Look how tall he is. Sorry, ladies, he's already taken. Getting married in October, Jakubis. And, uh, you know, when I was first born again, it was 27 years ago now, Jacob was like this big. Yet Daniel and Fiona opened their house. New baby, but opened their house to us guys. Amazing. Friends, this is what it means today to be a disciple of Jesus. It's really simple. Are you willing to pay the price? It's really simple. Can I put it in modern day vernacular? It's just as simple as someone who gave us stuff. Someone who gave us stuff. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Miss, Mr. and Mrs. B. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Daniel. I remember those days. We were so hungry. I can tell you, honestly, I went to Mr. and Mrs. B's house after that moment, that night, every single day for two weeks. I was so hungry, man. So hungry. But she opened her house every single time. So I left the addiction of drugs and got addicted to coffee. <laughs> <laughs> to which I have never kicked that habit. <laughs> Oh, man, good days. How many of you are here today because someone gave us stuff? Why don't you stand? If you're here today because someone opened their mouth, someone gave us stuff, I want you to stand there today. Yeah, why don't you give the Lord a hand? Because He, He today, He's the true hero of the story. He's the true hero of the story. Why don't you sit down? That's... That's awesome. That's awesome. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, friend, it does cost you everything. But I can tell you right now that the benefit so outweighs the cost. I'd die a thousand deaths just to know Him, just to get to know Jesus. You might be here today and you don't know Him. Can I just be straight with you this morning? This is what the Scripture says. God loves the world so much that He gave Jesus. He gave His one and only Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish. That was His intention. Would not perish, but have everlasting life. Today, you have a decision. Heaven or hell, life or death. It's as simple as that. A lot of the time we talk about that passage of Scripture in John chapter 3, but we sometimes don't give that bottom line. The Bible says this, and I want you to listen to me this morning. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life for the wrath of God remains on him friend if you want that wrath that anger outpoured on sin to be taken from you there is only one solution and that solution is come to Christ he died on the cross for you because he loves you he wanted to free you from sin and therein lies the gospel you believe it or you don't we can't be apologetic for that. That's just the way it is. It's a fact. Jesus rising from the dead, fact. 
We're going to look over, look into that over the next few weeks. Why don't you close your eyes, bow your heads this morning. Father, I thank you so much that you are here today and I pray for those who may be here in this place that don't know you, that somehow, some way, they may have been going to church for a while, but they really haven't counted the cost. They really don't know what it means to be a disciple. And so, Lord, I just pray for them that, Lord, today would be the day of salvation, like your word says, now would be the time that they would understand, as your word says, that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That Jesus, your words ring true in John chapter 14. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man will come to the Father except through me. And I pray that all those hearing today would understand that you are the way, the truth and the life. And that today they would come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.